Good evening. Good evening, welcome. Thank you all for coming. Where have we got to so far in, in this series of lectures? We've, we've seen how dependent society is on software. We've seen that there are a huge number of programmers worldwide. Uh, we've seen that cyber attacks are getting much more frequent and much more successful. We've seen that even the expert programmers make a lot of mistakes. Uh, the top 1% in the Watts-Humphrey experiment that I showed you last time were still producing over 10 errors per thousand lines of code, and the average is, is 10 times worse than that. We've seen that software is big, 10 million lines in a car, for example, and that means a lot of errors, even if they're programmed by the very best programmers. We've seen that a lot of software projects fail. They either get cancelled or they overrun badly or they don't deliver everything that they should. So what goes wrong? That's what I want to talk about tonight with some examples. Uh, either the development project fails or, or the product isn't good enough. And when the development project fails, it's, it's usually um, late and over budget and then gets cancelled. Uh, usually, what I've found when I've been doing expert witness work and, and been digging into failed projects is that the requirements keep changing, that the change management hasn't been good enough, and that the project's basically lost control and then lost the control the confidence of the customer and being cancelled. Um, when the product isn't fit for purpose, it's this range of, of problems, but these issues interact. And what happens is that when you get a buggy product, when you run into difficulties, when you're doing some testing, for example, uh, it causes delays, and the delays cause the developers to cut corners, and that creates more trouble on the projects, and the project loses control. One of the biggest difficulties in developing software is that it's not enough just to develop software. You've actually got to know that the software is going to be fit for purpose for the customer, and you've got to be able to provide adequate evidence for that. Otherwise, you're asking the customer, and I, I will typically talk from the perspective of a, a commercial developer, a software house, simply because <coughs> that's a lot of my background. But of course, the same applies for in-house development within a company. You've still got customers in the company, effectively. And if you're going to ask them to trust their business to your software, you, you better have strong evidence that you're not misleading them. Otherwise, you're just not behaving professionally. And one of the things about providing good evidence that software is fit for purpose is that it is actually harder than writing the software in the first place. And this is a, a theme that I, I will keep coming back to because I think it is at the heart of our problems. Testing software is never enough on its own to show you that something is fit for purpose, unless the purpose is essentially trivial. If, if it matters to you that you haven't got security problems or safety problems, if you haven't got bugs that are going to cause the, the system to become unreliable, testing it won't give you strong evidence. I gave a, a couple of examples of why that was in a previous lecture. I want to give you another one. And I, I want to use the example of, of testing whether uh, a weighing machine gives you the right answer. Uh, I was told a few years ago that the National Physical Laboratory used to be the testing agency that certified weighing machines. Maybe it still does in, in some way. And they ran into a real conceptual problem the first time they met a weighing machine with a microprocessor in it. Because if you've got a balance or a spring balance, You've actually got physical laws that enable you to say, if it's right for weighing one kilogram and it's right for weighing two kilograms, I, I can interpolate. I can say that it's going to be right for the weights in between because I've got physical laws that enable me to say 
but actually the behavior is linear between the measurements that I've taken. You can't do that with computer systems because they are not linear systems. They are discrete systems. They have a large number of different discrete internal states. And there aren't any physical laws other than the laws of logic that, that determine how the program behaves, if you're capable of analyzing those. There aren't any physical laws that enable you to say, I've tested it for this value, I've tested it for that value, it, it must be all right for the values in between. And that's at the heart of the testing problem. You can't just test at extremes and believe that it... Well, you can believe that it's going to be all right in between, but it won't necessarily be true. So what else makes software difficult? Firstly, it's complex. Software-based systems are inherently complex. And we'll see some examples of, of why that is later on in this talk. Quite rightly, as systems engineers, we put that complexity into the software rather than the hardware. Because the software gives us the power to do that. And so the software carries most of the complexity of the application, almost always. I mean, there, there will be a, a few uh, examples where that's not entirely true. But in general, the complexity of the application is in the software. And then people add extra features, because they can. And that's a real problem with software, that it, it appears to be so easy to add features to it, to do extra things, to make it more competitive against competitors, to do the, the nice-to-have things that people are asking you for, rather than the fundamental, in addition to the fundamental things that, that you know the software is going to need to do. And then, as, as we'll see in the April talk, the human aspects of the system make life more difficult. I'll leave that till next time. Software development's creative. You're doing something new. If it wasn't new, you wouldn't need a new system. You'd be able to use one that already existed. It's a very creative activity. And creating something complex is, is difficult, of course. And then we have these very difficult assurance targets. At, at one extreme, the, the control systems in aircraft, the instrumentation systems in aircraft, avionics, as, as we call them, have very, very demanding uh, probability of failure targets. The probability of failure per hour for an avionic system is supposed to be 10 to the minus 9, one in a, a billion hours failure. Because, well, again, when, when I talk later on in this series about safety-critical systems, I'll, I'll explain where that number came from and why it's the right number. But it's unachievable. You can't produce evidence that it's true. And that's a real real challenge, and as I say, it's one I'll come back to when we're talking just specifically about safety-critical systems. But in, in banking, you're, you're handling millions of transactions, carrying billions of pounds in very complex environments with lots and lots of different systems intercommunicating, and, and yet you mustn't make any mistakes, or very few. And then you've got cybersecurity problems, and we'll come back to that in the May talk, uh, when I, I plan to explain how some of these attacks really work and, uh, and get you all to prom promise that you won't go home and try them out. It's made worse by the fact that we're constrained. We're, we've usually got legacy systems we've got to be compatible with, we've got to interface to. Uh, unlike most engineering disciplines, there aren't very many trustworthy components. I'll say a bit more about that in a minute. And software developers are, are overconfident. Um, they have poor tools. They choose poor tools out of the ones that are available. And we don't have a profession yet that learns from its experience. All these things make software difficult. Here's a, a very simple example of of the complexity of a software-based system. Imagine you're, you're trying to design the software control system to do central locking in a car. That's an example I've, I've borrowed from the great computer scientist Michael Jackson. And I, I commend you to follow up the reference to the paper in the transcript and, and, and read his paper because it's, it's excellent. 
These are the sort of things that, that you need as in a central locking system. Convenient locking, unlocking. You don't want to override the childproof settings after you've locked and unlocked. You don't have to go round and reset them. You want all, all the doors locked while the car's moving so that, that nobody can open the door by accident and fall out. Uh, you probably want to be able to leave the boot locked when, when you give the ability to, to drive the car to someone else for valet parking purposes, for example. Automatic unlocking after an accident so that you can get out quickly. If, you, if you're in an accident, you don't want to find that you're locked in. Um, you want security against theft or against somebody breaking into the car while you're in it and, and forcing you to drive them somewhere. You want a low risk of things going wrong, of, of you getting locked in by accident and not being able to get out. Pe people have been and, and have died. Uh, or, or being locked out, which is obviously very inconvenient. And these, these things all interact with, with the hardware. And they may interact with each other. And these sort of requirements cause you, when, when you look into them, to ask lots of questions. Should the boot be locked when the car's stationary, but the engine's running? specification didn't say. Why would we want that? Because if we're stuck in a traffic jam, we don't want somebody coming up behind, opening the boot and stealing what's in it. Should a, an impact to a stationary car trigger the accident response that unlocks the doors? Well, what if it's a stationary car in a car park? Um, we, we've seen uh, that there, there was a, a spate of, of um, smart thieves spotting that with a particular model of car, if you kick the bumper in the right place hard enough, it, it triggered the airbags and opened all the doors so that they could break in and steal the contents. What should happen if you, you try to lock all the doors and the windows are open? That seems to violate the, the theft uh, issue. But, but then you might want to leave them open a bit for ventilation purposes. So how, how would that work? Should you be able to lock yourself in and disable any access from outside? You might want to for security. But if you do, then you've got problems, perhaps, of if, if you fall ill, nobody being able to get in to, to help you. What happens if the car loses electrical power? You may be able to detect that the battery is running down and that, that the locks won't work anymore after that. What, what should the control system do? There are lots and lots of increasingly complex issues that come out of what looks like a simple specification. And, and requirements interact. This is this an air crash. Um, happened uh, an A320 in, in Warsaw. Um, the, the aircraft ran off the end of the runway in landing. It was landing in a crosswind. The runway was, was wet. It was unable to stop on the runway. It ran off the end, uh, caught fire. Uh, people were killed and, and some people were very badly injured. What happened? The, the pilot, because of the crosswind, the, the pilot banked the aircraft. Uh, because the aircraft was banked, it landed on, on one wheel and only very, very lightly on the other one. The logic of the, um, the, the pilot tried to, to deploy the braking, the, the spoilers to, to kill the lift on the wings and the reverse thrust to, to slow the plane down, but it was locked out for nine seconds. Why? Because it has to be locked out in the air. It, it, it causes the plane to crash if you deploy those things in the air. That, that has actually happened in, in one crash, or at least it's, it's a su suspected cause, although I don't, don't think we know quite how it came about. So you have to detect that you've landed. How do you detect you've landed? Well, the particular logic here was that you had to detect a particular amount of pressure on both main landing gear or that the wheels had spun up to 72 knots, both of them. And because of the way the aircraft had landed, that didn't happen for nine seconds. And so for nine seconds, the plane wasn't being slowed down. And so it ran off the end of the runway and it crashed. Interaction between perfectly sensible requirements in unexpected circumstances causing behaviour that most certainly you don't want to happen. So we see requirements are, are complex. They also change. In, in a lot of the investigations I've done into failed projects, um, right at the heart of the failure is the log of changes that have occurred. 
And when I've looked at those changes, it's very, very rare that the things that have actually changed in the specification, in the requirements, in the design, in the, in the project, were things that were not known about by somebody at the beginning of the project. They're not real changes. They're failures to capture the requirements at the right time in the project development. And that's a key message, again, for, for effective software development. You get a lot of changes, and they kill you, those changes. So you want to minimise the changes that are going to hit you during the project. Okay. This was a, a particular example. Um, this was essentially a year 2000 problem. It was a, a, a major... Um, utility company, gas and electricity supply company, not in this country, and they knew that their, they were coming up to, to the end of the 1990s, they knew that their current system that did all the billing, all the scheduling of, of meter calls, carried all the customer information, carried all the details about the metering, and so on, that that had got year 2000 problems. It had to be replaced. They knew that it would fail. Um, they looked at the cost of fixing it, of correcting the year 2000 problems, but a group of management consultants recommended to them that that was a silly thing to do because what they ought to do was to use the money that would go into that project to implement a brand new system and get some additional facilities. So that's what they did. The management consultants drew up a, a set of requirements. On the basis of those requirements, they went and found a, a package and a, that, that looked as though it did the, the sort of job they needed, and they found a supplier who, who worked with that package to do the development. Uh, they estimated it was going, going to take 15 months. They had, I think, two and a quarter years, something like that, before year 2000 was going to hit them and cause problems. But actually, what happened was it took a year just to really get the detailed requirements right once they started doing the implementation, once they really looked at the detail of what they needed and what the package provided. Because that analysis hadn't been done early enough. And they found that there were interfaces to other systems that were much more complex than had been realised. They found that they had statutory requirements for the way that reports were laid out for example, which, which, of course, the package didn't conform to because it was from a different country. They had statutory constraints on how they were able to handle the accounts of people who weren't paying their bills because, of course, many of those people would be vulnerable people and had to be handled in a particular way by law. They had special charging tariffs for people on... on um, uh, kidney dialysis machines or people of, of, uh, in, a, in particular classes in society, all of which were not reflected in the way that the business processes were implemented in the package. Consequence of this was that the, the um, project actually slipped by so much that actually they had to scramble it into service uh, right towards the end of, uh, of, of 1999 not having even had the opportunity to test it as thoroughly as they had planned to, certainly not having done anything other than, than testing it by way of verification. Uh, and they completely lost control of their billing process. The call centre was overwhelmed. People stopped paying their bills because, because the calls weren't getting answered. They, they weren't collecting direct debits. The company ran out of money. They had to be bailed out by the state government. The state government then insisted that all the directors were sacked. Uh, it was a complete catastrophe for them. And it came down to the lack of doing a disciplined analysis of the requirements at the right time in the project. We're, we're a funny business software developers. We, we, you know, people call, uh, call us software engineers sometimes. I, I shy away from that unless I'm talking about people who are really using rigorous methods. But... As an engineering discipline, you would expect that we would have lots of trustworthy components the way every other engineering discipline does. 
components of known specifications built to particular standards, guaranteed by their manufacturers. We have almost none of that. And increasingly, programmers just steal software. They steal, not, not um, criminal theft, but they just copy it off websites or take it from open source libraries because it looks as though it does the right sort of thing. And so even in quite critical projects, if you dig into the project, you'll find that the people who are running the organization can't actually say where their software came from down to where did that module come from? Who, who wrote that particular procedure? Where did that bit of code arise? And so bugs get spread because people copy, copy buggy code. They incorporate off-the-shelf <coughs> components that have got bugs in. And we run into difficulties. And there isn't a market for verified components, except in a few specific areas in high-integrity real-time operating systems, you, you'll find one or two. But there aren't, companies aren't willing to create the market that would enable software companies then to develop libraries of trustworthy components. We just haven't matured to that point yet, and that makes software harder to do right. Software developers are optimists, and we don't specialise the way that many other disciplines do. You, you, don't, you don't get you know, gynaecologists doing brain surgery. The surgeons specialise in, in particular things because they know that that's how they're going to get really good at what they're doing. Um, electrical engineers don't do civil engineering work and <coughs> vice versa. Uh, almost everybody writes software, which is something I get quite cross about, but nevertheless, mostly engineers stick to their own areas. Software developers, on the other hand, just assume that they, can, that they can do it and it'll be all right. And we'll take on projects that are completely unknown to them, that, that are in areas that they've never worked in before. Sometimes they'll, they'll even try out something just because they feel they'd like to have it on their CV or because they've read about it in a magazine and it's fashionable. I was, I was auditing a, a, a project for the Civil Aviation Authority uh, many, many years ago now, and the architecture was a, was a three-level client-server architecture, which seemed completely unnecessary. And they were running into difficulties and running late, and I asked the project leader, why are you doing that? And he said, well, we'd never done one before, and we wanted it on our CVs. We're optimists, software developers. It, it seems to, to just go with the territory. We, we like to say yes and hope things will turn out well. We even believe that things will turn out well. They never do. And, and most organisations don't have the tools or don't choose to use the tools that you would expect an engineering organisation to use. At the heart of, of any major engineering design is, is a project office that, that keeps version control over all the key documents, for example. It, it's distressingly rare, if you dig into a software project, to find that the key documents are even version numbered and dated and, and authorised, you know, have, have signatures on showing who's signed them off and, and why they were approved and released. And, and so it, it can be really quite hard to find you know, which is the latest design? Which is the plan you're working to? You know, who drew up this test specification and who said that it was the right set of tests? Those sorts of disciplines are remarkably uncommon around the software industry even now. So what do people do to develop software? Well, you, you've probably seen the classic waterfall software development life cycle that goes from requirements through design to implementation to testing to deployment to, to maintenance. And, and sometimes people describe, they, they fold it in the middle around the coding uh, in order to show that, that the requirements and design come down one side and then the, the testing goes up the other side. And notice that it's always testing. Nobody talks about anything other than testing. There is this inherent assumption 
that the only way you can find out whether what you've done is good enough is to test it. And that's a disaster. Because what the arrows show is where the errors get detected. And the errors that you make early get detected very late. But they will then have to be changed very, very early in the process. And you'll have to work back all the way through again if you're going to do it properly. So what happens is that when you find errors late, people compromise. They try to introduce a fix that they think will be good enough, and they make the whole structure much more complex. They destroy any conceptual integrity that the design or the architecture had, or they find that they just can't do it. What you need to do is to progress in a way that picks up any errors you make very quickly, that shows that you're always staying consistent with the things that you said you needed to do. And that's the correct by construction approach to developing software. And again, I'll talk about that in, in a later lecture to, to explain how it works and why it's actually cost effective. Th these days, there's a lot of talk about agile methods and, and there's, a, there's a lot of strengths in, in what, what agile methods do. But, but at the heart of agile methods is, is the notion that we're, we're going to welcome change and we're going to focus on working software. What we care about is working software ahead of documentation or, or any of these other issues. How are we going to know if it's working? We're going to test it all the time. And we're going to test it in front of users so that the users get a chance to see it. And that will flush out some more, some more changes that need to be made. Well, that's all very well as a prototyping mechanism. And, and the software industry is jolly good at, at what, essentially following a process that is building prototypes and then delivering it to users as if it was a well-engineered product. It's dangerous if the reason you're not doing requirements analysis up front is that actually you want to put it off. You can't be bothered. Because it means you're pushing problems that may be serious for the decisions that you're taking early right down into the project, and you'll only find out about those problems after you've taken critical decisions. So if the system's safety critical or security critical, and you're going to need evidence that it is actually fit for purpose, Agile methods aren't going to deliver you that evidence in general. Not unless you've overlaid Agile on top of a very formal development process. It's dangerous if the system's architecture is complex, if it's going to be expensive to change. So it works fine if you're building a website just like all the other websites you've built. It doesn't work at all well if you're trying to build a system of the sort that you've never built before. And in fact, Kent, Kent Beck, who, uh, who developed extreme programming, uh, told me at a, at a meeting we were at that uh, the first time that he tried to use extreme programming on a system that um, he was running a team, building a system that, for an insurance company that uh, had a, a structure that he'd, he'd never seen before. They got into terrible problems and, and the project had to be cancelled. And, and it's disastrous, of course, if the system's going to have a long in-service lifetime because you won't have the documentation of what you've done to enable somebody coming behind you to maintain it effectively. How do other engineers get the right technical solution to a complex business problem? They use an architect. Nobody put up a building using agile methods. <laughs> so what would a system architect do in a software project? Well, they do what an architect does. They work with the client using their expertise to help the client to understand the possibilities for the system and how to get the requirements right and, and they would then design a, an overall system architecture that met those requirements and they'd do some high level design and they'd then move around to the client side of the table and help them to select the team that's going to do the development and to monitor and manage that development through to completion just as an architect for a building does. This works in a software business. Almost nobody does it. 
So what are, you, what are we doing when we're planning a software development? We need to find out what are we trying to do, the requirements specification, including the risks and uncertainties, because we're going to need to plan things into the project to handle them. How are we going to do it? This is technical planning. What tools and methods are we going to use? What kind of architectures? What components are we going to pull in? And how will we know it's good enough? And that's the quality plan. The quality plans are a list of all the deliverables you're going to produce, all the things you're going to deliver externally, but also all the intermediate deliverables within the project, and how you're going to assess the quality. What will a good one look like, and how will I know that it's good enough before I move on and sign it off and use it later in the project. So that's your quality plan. All the quality controls that you need on the project. And having done those things, you can produce a resource plan. You know, a standard hierarchic work breakdown structure, an activity network that shows all the interactions but between the, the different activities. You can put estimates against it, you can put resources against it, and so on. And for a big project, or even a medium-sized project, you know, you'll, you'll need tool support for that, of course, Microsoft Project or, or some e equivalent tool. And you'll need to iterate a lot, because when it comes out how long this is going to take and how much it will cost, the answer won't be acceptable. So you're going to have to go back and, and, and compromise and tune and make different decisions until you come up with something that's consistent and looks achievable. Every project's got risks. Things you don't know, things that you do know that, that might, might bite you. Yeah. Do we, will, will the approach that we've taken actually have the kind of performance that we're going to need in a hard real-time environment, for example? Um, sometimes you're building software for some hardware that hasn't been delivered, and you'll need to plan a um, an activity to actually simulate the hardware so that you can make progress with the software. The mitigation activities against a risk register of risks need to be real activities that take real resources, activities that get planned into the resource plan and that deliver genuine mitigations where you can justify that you really are reducing the uncertainty and that it's a cost-effective way to spend your project resources. Almost every risk register I see isn't worth the paper it's written on because the risks are superficial. They're not, they're, typically, they're generic. You know, people may leave the project. What are we going to do about that? Well, we'll hire more people. You know, the, the utterly trivial level of risk management that really doesn't get to the heart of, of what could go wrong and what you need to do about it. With a proper risk map, a proper risk register, your estimates are three-valued. How long is this going to take if everything that could go wrong and goes wrong and nothing that could go right goes right? How, how long is it going to take if nothing goes wrong and all the opportunities for doing better work out? So now you've got an upper and a lower bound on your cost and time scales. And then what's our best estimate, which, of course, will lie between those two? If you re-estimate that triple, those three values, every time you do a re-estimate frequently, you should see the spread narrowing. If you do, it shows that the project is reasonably under control because the amount of uncertainty in the project is reducing. If, on the other hand, your, your best estimate is coming down but the uncertainty is growing, you know your project's out of control. So, this is how things go wrong. Ambiguous, incomplete, contradictory requirements. Underestimated timescales and, and costs. Inadequate management of changes. And incompetence. Management incompetence or technical incompetence. <coughs> there's, there's quite a lot of that ab about. Uh, particularly management incompetence. Um, and, and then, of course, overlaid on that, as, as we've already seen, is complexity, which just makes everything else worse. 
So minimising complexity is, is actually a very, very important discipline and a very, very hard one to deliver on a project because everybody wants you to do a bit more and some extra things. And in many organisations, the lack of board-level IT knowledge is a real issue uh, in order to manage the business risks that come out of doing major IT projects. As, as a um, small-time investor in the stock market, if I read an annual report that says that the company I'm invested in is going to implement a new core IT system, I sell the shares. <laughs> I am almost always right. <laughs> if only I could find a, an equally good sign as to when to buy them. There, there was a, a, a dear chair exercise where the Bank of England and the regulators wrote round to the, the chairman of, of the major banks um, asking some searching questions about their governance. And, and in the latest round of that, the, the dear chair too, uh, as you'll see, if you, you go looking on the web, you'll, you'll find that um, almost none of the major deposit takers have got anybody on the board who knows anything about it, information technology. What this means is that if they were presented with a business risk register which genuinely contained the detailed IT risks that they run, and banks run a lot of IT risks, as you can see from the number of IT banking failures that that have been reported in the press just over the last you know, three or four months. If they were presented with that detailed risk register, they wouldn't understand it, let alone be able to manage the processes of what they should do about it. They wouldn't have the technical knowledge to understand the scale of the risks they were facing. That, that's clearly unacceptable and, and needs to be addressed by all organisations. You need people who understand your IT, just as you need people who understand your finances. Because your IT, in almost all organisations, is critical to your survival. When a project runs out of control, there are no easy ways to recover. Adding people to a, to a running project makes it later. This is, this is Fred Brooks' experience of managing the development of a, m, IBM's major operating system, uh, published in the Mythical Man Month, um, which he named after this specific phenomenon, that you can't schedule in terms of man months because they're a myth. You can't just look at that. And there are good reasons for it. It's because of the training overhead of bringing new people on, and it's because the more people you've got on a project, the more interactions there are between people, and that creates inefficiency in the project. So bigger teams are, are less productive than smaller teams, and you get to a point where if you add people to a project, you slow it down rather than speeding it up. So what do people do? They either cut stuff out, and that's the standard way of an agile project, uh, getting through to delivery. They, they cut down on the functionality with the agreement of, of the customers. Um, the other standard thing to do is to get your team to work harder and work longer hours and work weekends and work nights. Um, that works. That works. Uh, on a big project, what you find then is that almost everybody leaves the company when the project ends because they're committed to the project now but not to the company because they hate the company for the pressure it's put them under and the damage it's done to their, their work-life balance. Or you can cut out some activities and hope you get away with it. And, and testing is, is one that you quite often see people cutting out. Or, or of course, you can, you can give up and, and start again. This is a, a memorandum that hit the internet just uh, a few weeks ago, just, just last month. And as you can see, December the 11th, 2015, it's a very recent uh, memo. I have no idea how secret it was at the time. It clearly can't be now because it's all over the internet. Um, from uh, a very senior person in the Pentagon about the software development for the F-35 fighter, the, the latest, most important... Um, 
military aircraft that's being developed in America and, and which uh, the UK government is planning to buy and put on the aircraft carriers. Uh, it's, you'll, you'll see more of it in the, in the transcript, although I haven't, I haven't copied the entire memo in there. But as you can see, the plans that this official is, is criticising are actually to cut out test points. And actually, many of the problems that they've got, it turns out, are because they've done exactly that in the previous iteration of the software and have, have built the new block of software on top of software that, that had a whole lot of defects in it, which they never found time to fix. So they've got buggy software rolling forward in, in the project, and, and he's expressing serious concerns that there are going to be major vulnerabilities. But it is an example of the first reaction of people on a major project when things start to run out of control and they start to miss deadlines is firstly you slip stuff to later. You try to pretend you're meeting these milestones by pushing stuff into later milestones. And secondly, you cut out some of the testing because it looks as though it's something you can get away with doing. And on paper, of course, it is. It's only later in the project that you discover that actually that was a disaster. So with all these problems, with software being this hard, how is it that we read about kids, teenagers, writing apps and making themselves millionaires? And at the heart of it is that what they're doing isn't engineering, it's innovation. What they're making money out of is having a really good idea and then being able to turn it into something which at least superficially is good enough to attract an awful lot of people to start using it. And, and that makes you a lot of money because then some other company will want to buy that user population so they buy your, your company, your, your app and, and you get rich. But the reason it works is that the brilliant idea that they had that nobody else had had yet was initially a simple idea. And of course, they had a very small team, just, just you know, themselves and maybe a few friends. They didn't have any hard targets to meet because they weren't worried about safety or security or even particularly reliability. They, they were just going to focus on testing it until it felt good enough for for them to start rolling out and getting people using it. They didn't need to be careful because they don't carry any liability. And that's, that's one of the structural faults that we have in, in software development that actually is an inhibitor on our industry maturing into an engineering discipline is that we don't carry any liability. We write end-user license agreements that say you, know, you use this at your, your peril and if anything goes wrong, it's, it's all down to you. Um, you know, if you break the shrink wrap on the, on the CD, then um, you've you're accepted these license terms. And tick the box and carry on using the, the website or whatever it is, and nobody reads the license conditions because they're not written to be read. Um, some years ago, somebody wrote into some license conditions for a major piece of software that by, by using this software and ticking this box, you give me the right to your eternal soul. <laughs> and people just ticked the box and carried on using it. Uh, not even really a Faustian bargain, but nevertheless, I mean, if, if there is a market for souls out there, he's, he's cornered, cornered the market in it. And the other thing, of course, it's, it's the, the paradox of, of the wonders of Roman engineering. You know, how did the Romans build all these, these bridges that have lasted for 2,000 years? It's because all the ones that have fallen down aren't there, and they're not the ones that you're marvelling at. And in the same way, you never hear about, about the thousands of people who set out to write software to make themselves rich, and the software is, is just never successful. There are a huge number of apps out there that are not making their writers rich. It's the people who get the headlines, of course, are the ones who are spectacularly successful. So, developing software is hard because it's complex and creative. 
is hard because the important properties are emergent. I said a bit more about, about that in the transcript. Um, the, the properties that, that really matter to you, things like security, are system-level properties. And they're not necessarily properties of the individual bits of the system, the individual modules of software, the individual programs, the, the packages, the, the individual lines of code. You can build secure systems out of insecure components, although it's, it's hard because you really have to understand those insecure components, and if you did, you'd probably fix the insecurities. But more importantly, you can build very insecure systems out of a whole set of components, each of which is, is intrinsically secure. Uh, and we can get into a discussion about that later if, if that isn't obvious. But one of the good ways to understand emergent properties is, is to have a look at John Conway's game of life. John Conway is a mathematician who came up with this, this beautifully simple cellular automaton that has some, ex you know, defined by three or four very simple rules, and, and it has some extraordinary properties. So again, I've, I've given the reference to that in the transcript. Look it up online and marvel and play with it. It's, it's brilliant. But it just shows how a simple set of rules can produce a system that has quite extraordinary properties that, that are not the properties of the individual rules and not at all evident from the rule set. And the same thing happens in biological systems. And the, the rules that have been worked out for how it is that an ant colony cooperates the way it does boil down to a, a very small set of very simple rules which nevertheless manifest themselves then as complex biological behaviour. So emergent properties, they're hard. You can't test for them at all well. Or you can test for them, but you can't get strong evidence for them at all by testing. You have to do it by reasoning. And we're, we live in a world where the costs and timescales have got to be predictable for this complex and creative activity, which is hard. And in a world where... If, if we're doing a professional job, a good enough job, we've got to produce evidence that what we've done is good enough, which means we better know what we mean by good enough, and we better have taken account of the need to produce that evidence right up at the beginning of the project, because you'll never be able to add it in late in the project. If you haven't set about developing in a way that generates the evidence as part of what you're doing, you won't have the evidence. And then we've got an industry that has done wonderful things in, in the 60-odd years that it's been around, but which is being asked to do hugely important things now and much more important things in the future based on a set of people and a set of processes and, and a set of... of a sort of professional infrastructure that is far too weak to carry that load. If you look at it any other engineering discipline, you'll find that the, the standards, the, the principles, are, can be traced back to major accidents that have occurred. You know, nobody will ever build a, a, a bridge like the Tacoma Narrows Bridge again. Nobody will ever build a footbridge like, like the Wobbly Millennium Bridge because the models have been changed now. And so a competent engineer will just use the models that have been updated and will see that it won't have the properties that they want if they build it that way, so they won't do it. We've made a lot of mistakes in the software industry. Lots of systems have gone wrong. People have been killed. Billions of pounds have been lost as a result of software failures. And yet you can't point to a single mistake that has been made and show evidence that that is something that nobody will ever do again, or even that no competent person, properly trained, will ever do again. Because we don't have the mechanisms to do that yet. And one of the key things about this lecture series is I, I want us all to feel anxious about that, and wherever we can to do something about it. 
or to put pressure on other people to do something about it. We need to mature this industry into a proper rigorous engineering profession because otherwise we're, we're building a lot of important things on very, very shaky foundations and, and that, that doesn't... Typically it doesn't turn out well when you do that. So, thank you for, for listening. Please join in the discussions online. Um, I, I will look forward to discussing some questions, if, if you have any. Uh, and I'll just leave you with a couple of quotes from, from the, the great computer scientist Tony Hall, uh, Sir Tony Hall, um, who really does emphasise this point that complexity is what, what kills you. So, thank you very much. Thank you.